Hello viewers, we are here today to learn more about the origins of the Taj Mahal. And in this respect, we have the distinguished company of Professor Marvin Mills. Professor Marvin Mills has received an MA in philosophy, another in architecture, and a third in the history of architecture. He has several years of teaching experience at several universities across the United States, including the Ohio University and the University of South Florida. Apart from being an academician, he's also worked as a professional architect for several years, beginning in 1956 till the early 1990s. Professor Marvin Mills, uh, welcome and thank you very much for being here. I'm very glad to be here. Professor Marvin Mills, um, there are three popular theories on the origins of the present-day Taj Mahal. The first one says that Shah Jahan built the monument right from the scratch, and that's the standard view. The second theory is that Shah Jahan only modified an earlier palace that was built by Jai Singh to serve as the mausoleum for his queen, Mumtaz. And the third popular theory is that the monument was originally a temple. What is your opinion, and why do you feel so? Well, my opinion is that the, uh, the monument was originally a, basically a palace mm -hmm. which had a temple included in it. Mm -hmm. That's my view. And this is, uh, as I understand uh, P. N. Oak's view, the, this is basically how he looks on the matter. Okay. And what do you mean by a chapel in, originally in the palace? Oh, that it, what do I mean by... You said that there was a that it was originally a palace, right? Oh, yes. Okay. That's, okay. that's my view, that it was originally a palace. I'm quite convinced that that's the case. Why do you feel so? Can you throw some more light on the same? How I, can I throw more light on the thing? Well, <clears throat> uh, there, uh, there's a lot of evidence to the effect that uh, it is not, was not originally a tomb, and really that evidence has to be looked into. Okay. Now, would you please tell us about the carbon dating that you and your team had conducted? Yes. The carbon dating and scientific dating in general is quite important for this controversy. Mm -hmm. And let me explain. There are basically two points of view regarding the Taj, one that it was built in 1631, mm -hmm. Shah Jahan, the other that it's really centuries older. Okay. And while there is evidence on both sides, uh, the only way ultimately to resolve the dispute is to scientifically date the materials from which the Taj was built. Of those of the scientific methods, there are basically two mm -hmm. that are of use to us there. Uh, one is the carbon-14, and the other is thermoluminescence. Mm -hmm. Now, carbon-14 is the one I become involved in. Okay. Not because it's the most useful to, for this project, but because it was the easiest to uh, begin with. Uh, the point about carbon-14 is that you can, in examining anything that's organic, like wood from a tree, okay. you can determine when that tree was cut down. Okay. And therefore, soon after, you would expect, normally expect, that that piece of wood was used in okay. construction. Okay. On the other hand, I've always said that uh, there are caveats, there are warnings mm -hmm. in using this method. Mm -hmm. First, uh, one sample is really not sufficient. Right. And there's only been one sample ever taken of the Taj Mahal that I'm aware of, and it was by myself, okay. and I had it dated. But that one sample could uh, very easily uh, be distorted in that the, uh, depending on which part of the tree the sample is taken, okay. you see, uh, if it's taken from the inner part of the tree, uh, the core, mm -hmm. uh, or if it's taken from the sapwood, which is the exterior part. Now, the inner part of the tree dies, in a sense, as it gets older. Right. And only the sapwood is the live part. So that the depth of the tree doesn't occur then really, as far as dating goes, when the tree is cut down. Right. But when the hardwood is formed in the center, okay. the hardwood. So that could introduce errors of a couple of hundred years. Wow. So th this is very important to keep in mind. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> also, there is no certainty 
with the dating as far as there's a probability factor and there is, uh, uh, there is also a possibility of contamination. So uh, the good part about, carbon, about the dating by carbon-14 has been that it's alerted the world to the possibility of not accepting the historically derived date that we all adhere to at the moment, but to challenge it and to ultimately settle it conclusively. Uh, and this without regard to what the art historians, the architectural historians think about it. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, this issue will be decided that way, but probably not through carbon-14, probably through thermoluminescence. Okay. Now, where did this wooden sample originate from? Well, there's very little wood in the Taj Mahal. Okay. But doors are made of wood. Mm -hmm. And there is a door that goes to the beach from the back, that is the south side of the Taj. Okay. And that door is in very bad repair. And it's been really, that entryway has been bricked up. But there is exposed wood from the door that's still there. Okay. So that wood is, was used. Uh, basically, you would not want to use wood from a door because doors can be changed, you see, frequently. Right. But uh, wood from timber would be better from construction. As an expert in architecture, what do you think are the different motifs that confirm and violate Islamic beliefs in the Taj? Well, <clears throat> the, I would say foremost, the most striking Islamic motif is the Quranic script mm -hmm. that is in the rectangular surround around the four entryways to the Taj Mahal. Okay. Uh, naturally, one would expect that if there's Quranic script on a building, then therefore it is an is Islamic building. The problem there is whether or not the Islamic script is original. Okay. And if uh, Shah Jahan converted a palace temple mm -hmm. into a tomb, which mm -hmm. is, I think is the truth, of course he would have to remove any, uh, any symbols okay. of Hindu religion that were outstanding. Mm -hmm. I believe that in that rectangular surround there must have been some very decisive symbols okay. of Hinduism that he could not tolerate, although there are others here that he did, and that something was removed and in its place was put these marble uh, plaques with the Quranic inscription on it. Okay. Now, from an aesthetic point of view, and this is very subjective on my part, but I believe this to be the case, that it doesn't belong, that the color, uh, the design, does not belong in the general appearance of the facade of the Taj Mahal. Oh, okay. Uh, not only that, the marble itself looks like it's... Uh, implanted, okay. and also it looks like it's discolored, like it was put uh, with not too much expertise in places. Okay. So that's one thing. But the bigger problem than that is the fact that from, the, from most people's point of view, in general, we just say, well, that building looks Islamic. Right. You see, its features look Islamic. It doesn't have any Hindu statues hanging from it. And it has all these arabesque and these geometric designs. And it has the uh, archways mm. that we associate with Islam. Mm. It has what looks to be like Islamic features. This is a problem, though, in history because it raised the issue, did Islam borrow these features mm. from places like India and elsewhere, and, uh, or are they uh, original with, it, with Islam in this building? So you see, you have to get a different mindset. You have to think, perhaps many of the features that we now associate with Islam mm -hmm. already pre-existed in, previously in a Hindu architecture. Very interesting. And what about the motives that uh, violate Islamic beliefs? Can well, the, there are many. First, I would point out that the, there's a basic difference between Hindu architecture and Islamic architecture in general. Mm -hmm. That is, Hindu architecture is very much associated with Hindu sculpture right. in that it is a three-dimensional affair. Whatever side you look at a Hindu architecture or a sculpture, it, it reads well. Mm -hmm. 
There's a very strong tendency, on the other hand, in Islam to create a facadism, a facade architecture, which I'm not criticizing, but it is distinctive that they will take what you see at first, what is most visible to the public eye as you approach, as like a theater set, mm -hmm. and that what's behind it is really not quite important. The Taj is obviously a three-dimensional affair. But more important than that is the issue of the Hindu symbols mm -hmm. that exist in the main structure of the Taj complex, which I'll point to. The lotus is the most important symbol in Hindu religion. Mm -hmm. There's no question about it. If it were a Hindu building, and especially a part of it, a Hindu temple, there you would expect to see the lotus as a symbol. And indeed, you do find it. What is the archway, the four archway? Okay. This is the lotus petal, you see. Mm -hmm. And the lotus that floats on the water, it, it, a sun, like a sun symbol, is on the side of the building in many places. Okay. So, and this is really not disputed. I myself believe that the bulbous dome on top mm -hmm. is a symbol of the lotus bud. Although a uh, expert uh, who wrote on this, Rex Hester and Hoppel, attributes it to the lotus leaf, okay. which also takes that shape. So I would say that the lotus permeates the symbolism. A person like Shah Jahan, a mogul, would not tolerate purposefully the main Hindu symbolism in a building that he was building. Mm -hmm. But if he had captured it, yeah. he might live with it rather than try to erase all of these, especially the dome, You're not about to take it, tear it down. So that's my answer to you. Okay, thank you. Now, continuing the discussion on the motifs, uh, what are the motifs which indicate that the Taj Mahal is a grave and what are the motifs that indicate otherwise? Well, the principal thing that indicates it's a grave is that there are tombstones there. Okay. You know, on the main level, the very focus of the whole main building of the Taj are the two graves of uh, Mumtaz Mahal and Shah Jahan. Okay. Below them in the crypt below, directly below, are two more cenotaphs that duplicate this. Exactly who was buried there, we're not sure, actually, mm -hmm. because we don't know. But, but uh, if you come there and you see grave stone, graves, you say, well, then this is a tomb. Okay. So that uh, primar is the primary reason you would expect it to be a tomb. Plus the literature, it's been declared a tomb. Shah Jahan and his uh, chroniclers have called it a tomb. Everybody's calling it a tomb. And uh, nobody really, uh, until Oak came along, has disputed that, that fact. The fact of the matter is that in its general appearance, it doesn't appear to be a tomb. Uh, recently, uh, Hillary Clinton was at the Taj mm -hmm. with Chelsea, mm -hmm. and they were standing there looking at this wonder. Isn't it marvelous, they said to each other. And what did Chelsea say? That's a beautiful palace. Okay. Now, she didn't know anything about this controversy, mm -hmm. but she assumed in looking at this building that it must be a palace. Okay. So that the, uh, it, it doesn't have the appearance of a tomb. Okay. It has appearance of a palace. Okay. Tomb is a very sad, dismal affair, and a palace can be a very gay and uplifting type of thing. It's the latter. Okay. So, do you, so you think that goes against the fact that it could be a grave? Yes. Okay. Now, there are 22 r rooms in the rear, and... Um, the entire Taj complex, if you see, has around 400 to 500 rooms. Yes. Why would a mausoleum have so many rooms? The mo a mausoleum ordinarily would not have so many rooms. Mm -hmm. That is exactly the problem. The, uh, I've been in the 22 rooms that are down below, facing out on the Jumna, and they must have originally been quite beautiful. They're all in a row, and they were decorated with plaster and paint. The ceilings are gorgeous, you could tell. They once were gorgeous. They are in a, uh, a net type of a sculptured fashion. They were painted, and they were obviously very cheerful, pleasant places. I would guess that these rooms were for guests coming to the palace, arriving on the Jumna, coming on the beach, going up the stairs, 
perhaps through the very door that I got my sample from, mm -hmm. and going into their rooms or approaching it from another direction. Uh, <clears throat> the other rooms indicate that this complex is for a, a very complicated reason, not just for a burying a, a person. Mm -hmm. It's obviously meant to serve uh, many visitors, to carry on many functions. In other words, a palace would ordinarily have hundreds of rooms. A tomb ordinarily would not ne need that many rooms. Okay. Now, in, in 1652, Aurangzeb uh, ordered repair to almost all the domes. Is it possible for such a large-scale deterioration in less than 20 years of the construction of the Taj to actually happen? And do you think that such a deterioration would have been due to hasty construction and settling of the structure? It's possible. Hasty construction, no. Because you cannot see evidence of hasty construction at the Taj. It's a very well-built, carefully executed a complex. Uh, settling, there could have been, uh, but the settling, and there is now settling by the way, uh, that could possibly have happened, but you would have expected then not so much leaks in the roof as uh, cracks in the walls, things like that would have occurred. Okay. Uh, this is possible. I think though a more reasonable explanation uh, would be that the building was hundreds of years old and if your building is 100 years old, you're entitled to have a few leaks. Right. And that's the real explanation for it. Okay. So it's a matter of which is a more reasonable explanation. Okay. So you don't think that something that uh, would have taken, you know, would have been just 20 years could no, have... No, ordinarily had... you would not have expected anything to have happened in, the, in 20 years. Okay. No. Now, is there any other Saracenic building where the minarets are detached from the main building? And what is the purpose of these minarets on a grave? Well, this to me is a very important piece of evidence for those who support the oak point of view. Okay. You know, of course, that mosques do often, not always, but they often have minarets, which serve an important function. The mosque does not have any minarets. Okay. And yet there are four minaret-like structures in front of the main Taj building, in front of and along, around it. Uh, <clears throat> Those minarets obviously do not serve, so-called minarets, do not serve the mosque, okay. which is a distance removed and architecturally is not related to it. It's related to the main building. Okay. So what are those buildings for? Those buildings must be more in the nature of watchtowers or of uh, signal towers or of being lit up in order to enhance the Taj at night. Okay. Towers are not unusual things in in Indian architecture, and uh, this is probably what they were for. Okay. So, um, you think that the uh, absence of a minaret in the mosque next to the Taj could valid the uh, Islamic architecture? The absence of it? Yeah. Well, I would think that uh, you would normally expect there to be minarets there, okay. at, attached to the to the mosque itself. Okay. Now, what do you think is the purpose of the Nakar Khana or the music house in a grave? My understanding is that it would be out of place in a tomb <laughs> okay. such as this, that you would not have music in such a situation. Okay. And if it was really a music house, then it, it would be appropriate for a palace, but it would not be appropriate for a tomb. Okay. What about the community hall that is right next to the Taj? Well, what do you think was its purpose? You know, the Taj complex is symmetrical, right? And on one side, opposite the main Taj building, is the mosque, and the other is this community hall or whatever. They're both built exactly alike. One is a mirror image of the other because yeah. this is part of the symmetry. And yet we are told that this is a mosque on the one side, on the west side, and the other is, has an entirely different function. Now, from an architect's point of view, something is badly designed here. Either the mosque is badly designed or the residence or, or the community hall is, is badly designed. But the Taj Mahal is, is not badly designed. It's the best, maybe the best designed building in the world. Mm -hmm. So this anomaly, this difference between the two buildings uh, can only be explained 
uh, I mean, the sameness of the building can only be explained by the fact that they're both doing relatively the same thing, that they're both really residents for the palace and therefore will look, look alike. Okay. Now, also, can you throw some light on the presence of the treasury well in the uh, Taj Mahal? Mm -hmm. What do you think would have been its purpose? Well, I, I think uh, a well, wells are very uh, are, are important in India. It's a mm -hmm. very hot place. Right. And uh, the, this well, the, I took a picture of it, and, uh, mm -hmm. and the pictures showed that there are levels of the well, at least four visible, maybe more, mm -hmm. and that it would, could easily well have served as a place to go in the extreme heat and it'd be air conditioning so you could actually stay there in the hottest part of the day or the year. Uh, also, it's reputed to be, a, a, Oak thinks of it as a place where treasure could be thrown in and hidden mm -hmm. uh, and oops, put underwater perhaps until the invader went or it could have been used for that purpose. But I'd have to say too that no matter what that building was about, a well would be useful, okay. you know? So do you think its relevance is still uh, applicable to a More grave? applicable, more reasonable that it would be part of a palace than a tomb. Okay, okay. Um, if you see the approach to the Taj, it is dotted with hillocks that are raised with the earth dug out from the foundation trenches. What are these hillocks meant for? Well, let me explain my view of the defense of the palace. Mm -hmm. The palace has walls around it that are quite formidable, very high, very strong, and have a moat on their east and west sides and a river on their north side. In addition to that, the uh, walls are in a medieval fashion. That is, they are straight and they are crenellated. If you remember the Middle, Middle Ages, that's with how they made their defenses. You'd get up on top and you shoot your arrow and so on. But by the time that the, uh, India was invaded by the Mughals, 1526 is when Babur had his victory, he was using artillery. Mm -hmm. So by the 17th century, another 100 years later, artillery is well established. And when you made fortified walls, you didn't make them in the medieval fashion. You would make them in a zigzag triangular fashion with little triangles with artillery pieces. And this is the way 17th century cities or, or palaces or fortified areas were fortified. Okay. So it's an antiquated system pointing to an earlier type time of construction. Okay. So the hillocks are another part of what I consider the defense of the original palace. Okay. That is, to keep armies from coming quickly and, and attacking, they, and uh, to keep them, they, they would have to have these obstructions, which would be in their way and keep them from, uh, from attacking the, the fort, the palace. That's so, what they, so the hillocks, in the time of Shah Jahan, he had a different view. He wanted to show off his tomb. Okay. So he wanted the hillocks down. And this was no longer a fortified palace. It was a tomb, so he wanted the hillocks down, so they were removed. Okay. Uh, Professor, what would be your five key questions to the proponents of Shah Jahan built a Taj Mahal from the scratch theory? Well, the uh, five key questions, the, uh, I have at least five, <laughs> that the... Uh, <clears throat> Why is it so that why the, we've already mentioned this, why this complex, hundreds of rooms and so forth, mm -hmm. and why this apparently functioning, a functioning palace, if you examine it, uh, why is it built that way, and yet we think of it as a tomb, and yet this is one of the greatest pieces of architecture in the world. Mm -hmm. So there's this contradiction here. That, that would be one question. The other we talked about, the question of the Hindu symbolism. Okay. Um, they really have to explain. Now, the way that's been explained, everything has, of course, an explanation. Right. The explanation is, well, you see, Shah Jahan was a very decent chap, <laughs> and he was being very ecumenical, and that he was allowing uh, Hindu workers to express themselves. Mm -hmm. He not only had Hindu workers doing the work for him, but he gave them leeway. So if they chose to put Hindu symbols, well, give them a, give them a break. You know, that's quite all right with him. But as Pianok points out, uh, this is uh, 
Shah Jahan was not that type of person. He was not that type of person. He was a, a very mean-spirited person. He was lascivious. He was greedy. He had all these negative traits, and he had campaigns of, uh, to destroy the uh, Hindu opposition. Mm -hmm. So that uh, it's not uh, reasonable see, that, uh, <clears throat> that he would do all of this. Uh, the other questions are, uh, let's see, I would say, uh, <clears throat> well, I have to think about it now. All the minarets are an important question, mm -hmm. right? Um, there are more. They'll come to mind if you ask other questions. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, just moving on, if you have to um, make your uh, summary opinion on the whole issue, why do you think is it important to even find out about the origins of the Taj Mahal? Well, now th this is why in all of art and architectural history, the issue of the Taj is the most important most important. When Oak wrote his book, he wrote what I consider the most important book on architectural history in the last 50 years or so. Mm -hmm. It was really earth-breaking. Even though you can't find it in the libraries, nobody knows about it, nobody knows who he is, and he's shunned like a leper by the academic community. Mm -hmm. But that book is, uh, is uh, turning the whole history not only of India, uh, not only of the Taj, but of the whole question of the um, alleged Muslim buildings in India. All of them are questioned mm. as to their origin. And then there is the whole issue of, in the whole Islamic empire, mm -hmm. which stretched all the way from Spain all the way to, uh, to, to Indonesia, uh, what, which buildings are originally Muslim and which aren't? Okay. Now, Therefore, we're getting into the whole world issue here of which buildings are originally Muslim, which aren't. I myself am involved now in a study of Spain, for example, mm -hmm. where alleged buildings and mosques in Spain, the Mosque of Cordoba particularly, is, uh, I question its origin as a, as a mosque. Mm -hmm. So to know the truth about the historical development, especially since the Taj is considered the peak of development in India of all architecture, hmm. right? Right. Now, if the peak is wrong, if you've identified that incorrectly, then there are all kinds of mistakes that have made along the way. And actually what's gone on is history has filled in the gaps to support the contention right. that that is a Shah Jahan building. Now we have to re-examine all of Indian history, not only its art, but its politics and everything else and we have to examine all our ideas about the whole relationship of uh, Indian, art, Indian art, Indian culture to, uh, throughout history. That's uh, the most important question. So I think it's really an uh, issue of giving credit to the right people who actually you know, built right one people. of the best architectures in the world. Yes. And what do you think could be done to unravel this truth? Well, what really should be done is that there shouldn't be isolated people like myself, or even heroic people like, like Oak, and, uh, and others, there are others in the country, in India there are many, but there should be an institute, there should be, uh, and Oak tried to start one, an institute, uh, there should be a many-sided institute with various uh, types of expertise who tackle this problem, you see, and study it, and have the, the consent of various governments, not only consent, but their actually uh, willingness to uh, aggressively uh, look into the problem and settle it once and for all, so we can go on. Are there any other structures built by Shah Jahan which exhibit non-Saracenic motives? Yes, I think there are. The, I'd like to point out that the, uh, the mosque in the Taj complex and the mosque in Delhi the Great Mosque in Delhi have a certain feature which I consider really uh, very suspect as far as uh, Muslim features go. Mm -hmm. That is, they have three domes. Mm -hmm. Now, Hinduism is a very complex religion. Uh, Islam, there are some very specific features and not very many of them. That is, and one of them is the unity of God. Mm -hmm. Their argument with Christianity and with Hinduism 
is the argument against a trinity, that God could possibly be di divided into pieces, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. No, they said there's a unity of God. To have three domes, you see, mm -hmm. is not expressive of a unity. It's yeah. flying in the face of the idea of a unity. In my view, a, an Islamic architect would not purposely design a building with three domes. Because of that reason, he would make sure there was one, and that should express the unity of the religion. So that, that point, I think, is very important. Okay. Now, there are many welcome signs, such as uh, the cardamom, pot, cardamom pots and uh, rose water cans in the Taj. What do you think uh, are their uh, relevance in a Saracenic architecture? Well, of interest is the, uh, <clears throat> the pinnacle of the Taj. You know, that pinnacle above the main dome is 32 feet high. Mm -hmm. It also has its replica, uh, a drawing of a sketch of it in the pavement on the terrace that's right next to the main Taj building. Mm -hmm. Not many people know that, but you walk on it. It's right in the sandstone terrace. Now, that the a, a Muslim pinnacle is ordinarily a spike, a very simple sp spike. This pinnacle is quite elaborate. Mm -hmm. It's got kalash, the kalasha, yeah. the water pot. You know, it has mango leaves. It has a coconut, and it has a very. Uh, it has what could be interpreted as the trident of Shiva, okay. at its very top. Okay. Now, these symbols are relate to Hinduism, but mm -hmm. they don't relate to Islam. By the way, the trident symbol, I, uh, I should mention, is embedded in the very peak of the entryways. There's a, uh, a flower with the trident, red with the trident embedded in it, at the very peak of the entryways, at the uh, four directions of the Taj. That, I think, is the trident. Mm -hmm. Oak thinks it's a trident. Okay. If it's a trident, it would never get there if Shah Jahan built. Never, never, never. Okay. So uh, that's important. Okay. Now, Taj has a reverberating dome. Whose architecture is this? And what would be its purpose from an architectural point of view? Well, <clears throat> If that space is in fact devoted to a temple, which it probably was, although it's hard to know because it seems that they were that was the center of the secular area of the palace. But if it was, uh, the the Om sign mm -hmm. sound okay. could have been reverberated that way, and okay. it would have been useful. What that would serve, what what that reverberation would serve in a Islamic tomb, I have no way of knowing. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, Professor, uh, this conversation was very interesting, and uh, your, your viewpoints have uh, thrown a lot of light on this area. Thank you very much for being here, and we really appreciate you being here. And have a great evening. Thank you, and I appreciate you inviting me. I was, uh, it was great. Uh, I enjoyed doing it.